Hey, what's up? I'm Stefan, the organizer and host of the EMBO++, the next level conference for embedded software developers. The talk you're about to see is about power management and embedded systems. It was given by Colin Waltz at the EMBO++ conference 2021, and thanks to Leica Geosystems, you can check out this video for free. Hello, everybody. I'm Colin Walls, and uh, I'm here to talk about power management. And uh, what I need to do is to put up uh, my slides. So, yes, you should see the beginning slide of my presentation here. So, I'm going to talk about power management in embedded systems. And I'm going to talk about it uh, really from a, a software perspective. Um, even though power management seems like a hardware thing, um, you'll see that uh, software is, is kind of important. Um, now, I work for uh, Mentor. Well, actually, we are, we are now part of Siemens, so the Mentor name is going away. And uh, on the screen, you see my uh, email address and the address of the, uh, the blog that I maintain, where I talk about embedded software and really anything else that happens to be on my mind. So let's get going with today's uh, presentation. We should have plenty of time for questions um, at the end, uh, which you're welcome to type into the, uh, the chat box, uh, which uh, is on the left-hand side. So here we go. Here is the um, agenda that I want to talk about today. So I'll do um, an initial um, introduction and then I will discuss various aspects of power management, starting with the, uh, the hardware choice factor and moving on to various other things, um, use cases, choice of operating system and the underlying components and the um, aspects of the design which affect power management drastically, things like use, use of hibernate and suspend, a few comments about application development, and then I'll consider the measurement and testing of systems from a power point of view, and then wrap up with some conclusions. That's the plan. So, um, that's right. first of all, some introductory comments. It's quite likely that in your pocket, you've got something like that. It may not look exactly like that. This doesn't exactly look state of the art. It's but, but mobile phones more or less take this form factor, a little slab of, uh, of metal in our pocket. We're used to what they're like. We're never quite happy with them. They, ne they always um, run their batteries down too fast and things like that. But actually, the guys who design these are very smart when it comes to um, handling power. Because if they did not optimize your phone for power management to, uh, to get anything like the performance you're used to, your phone would look more like this. It would be three to four times thicker, simply to accommodate the extra battery needed. Um, and that would not be very acceptable. It would probably barely fit in your pocket. And, and people who are a little older will remember early mobile phones um, would not fit in your pocket. Um, and we would still be there if it wasn't for um, smart power management. Oh, incidentally, you would also probably have a fan on the side of it. So not only would your pocket be bulging with this heavy brick-like device, but you would have a purring noise from your pocket all the time, which would not be fun. Good news to say, these guys know about power management. Let me lead you down the path that uh, they have explored. Now, the importance of power management is steadily growing um, for a number of reasons mainly because we have so many battery powered devices and they're pretty complex so you consume a lot of power and connectivity is now very important if i've been talking to you 10 or 15 years ago uh, i would have said oh maybe 10 percent of embedded devices are connected it's now more like 70 percent connectivity is commonly wireless connectivity and that consumes power the problem is the power optimization is often done late in the design. That is not efficient, it's not sensible, it's not safe, really. You need to consider power from the outset. As soon as you start your design, you need to think about power management. 
So what do we need to do? We need to choose hardware with the right capabilities. I said I'm going to focus on software, but I accept the point that starting point is choosing the right hardware. That hardware must allow the software to manage power. And the logic of this is the software knows what's going on at any one time and therefore can um, make sensible decisions about what resources it needs and hence control the power consumption. Proceeding down that list, we need to choose the OS and its drivers. We need to define power usage profiles. Um, now, those are different combinations of hardware and hardware performance, which um, we all use at different times, which affect the power consumption of a device. We will set some measurable goals, and we use those goals all the way through the development process. And I will illustrate this by example in due course. I want to introduce a concept here. This is what we call the power pyramid. And this shows the relative importance of various aspects of the system. If we start at the bottom, the most important thing, even though I'm a software engineer, I have to admit the most important thing is hardware. Because ultimately, the hardware sets the um, limiting factor for power consumption. You cannot consume less power than the hardware lets you consume. Um, so it's very important that, that that is in place. The next layer is use cases. This is however the device is used at different times, it will have different power requirements. And each of these scenarios we call a use case. And the definition of use cases is absolutely fundamental to power management. So that's uh, the next most important thing, the first part of the software that's important. Above that is the operating system. Choosing an operating system with the right functionality is pretty critical to getting good um, power management. Part of the operating system that's very important there is uh, the board support package on drivers. Right at the top of the pyramid is the application code. This has least influence on power. Um, you could do very little in the application code to control the, the, um, the consumption of power. You can probably do things um, which don't help the power consumption, but um, it, this is not the area we want to consider too much. So let's start and consider hardware choice. I'm not going to talk about choosing specific chips. I'm going to talk about the general philosophy. As I mentioned, this is the biggest influence on power consumption and defines how good we can get it. The facilities from a power management facility, from a power management perspective of the CPU are critical. But we also need to look at the wider hardware design to ensure that everything's compatible. Now, the kinds of things we need to be able to do, we need to be able to turn off hardware blocks. In other words, turn peripheral devices on and off so that at a given time, only the required peripherals are powered up. Now, to give you a rather frightening um, perspective on how important this functionality is, there are devices around at this time which have so much hardware, so much um, functionality on the silicon, that if everything was switched on at the same time, it would self-destruct because it would just be um, consuming too much power, dissipating too much heat. So actually, such devices need blocks turned off when they're not in use. That's a bit of a scary prospect, the idea that software actually, by turning on all the hardware blocks, could just destroy the device. But that is a possibility. So that's the first thing. We also need some functionality called DVFS, the dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. And this defines things we call operating points. Now, from a software point of view, it may not be obvious to you that if you change the voltage and frequency, most interesting is the frequency of a processor, the amount of power it consumes is reduced. It makes some kind of sense because the faster you run the processor, the more work you can get done. So it doesn't seem unreasonable that it should consume more power. Um, so if you haven't got much work to do, the best thing you can do is reduce the frequency down to a frequency which is good enough to do the job in hand and thus reduce the power consumption. And we may have a number of uh, points on the scale of different frequencies, which we will use for different purposes. And we call those operating points. We also have low power modes. Most CPUs nowadays have some options here. Um, they're all different. 
The two that I will, will discuss in more detail later are suspend and hibernate. These are rather arbitrary names. The names are, um, are different from one um, uh, manufacturer to another. But I use the terms that are commonly used in the Windows PC world, suspend and hibernate. We'll come back to that. And lastly, a facility which you don't need this, but is, a, is an option, is what I call DVFS on steroids, which is you have a multiple CPUs, but they come in pairs. You have a low power version and a more powerful twin. Um, that's a fairly specialized kind of architecture. The way that works very quickly is here we have a timeline. And at one point, you may have a pair of processors, the high power one and the low power one, and the high power one is doing the work. That's why it's red. In due course, perhaps everybody is rather idle, but there's not too much work to be doing, so they're both shut down. At some later point, maybe the low power processor can do all the necessary work, so it's powered up instead. And then later on, perhaps the high power one will take over again. The idea is that these processors can both execute the same set of instructions, have access to the same memory, but depending on which one you're using, the amount of power consumed will be very, uh, will be drastically different. But that's a fairly specialized way of doing power management. Let's move on to the mainstream approach to power management use cases. To do this, um, we need to think about the functionality of a device. And most devices will have different functions. They perform at different times. This may or may not be involving user interaction. And I thought a good way to illustrate this is to invent a hypothetical device and figure out how it might work. Now, this device, as I say, it's hypothetical, but it's fairly um, believable, is a medical device. It's battery powered. It has a, um, an LCD display, and what it does is it monitors the patient's vital signs, and it will upload that data using Wi-Fi so that their doctor can see it. So instead of staying in a hospital wired up to machines, you would carry this device around with you. It would be very compact, and it would send this information to your doctor all the time. That's quite an attractive prospect. You don't want to be in a hospital when you don't need to be. So this is quite a realistic possibility. So, I don't know what the device will look like, but um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, probably the picture on the right is a kind of thing one might see. So, use cases. Number one, use case. The device takes a complete measurement of vital signs. Use case number two, the device uploads a set of measured data using Wi-Fi for the doctor to see. Use case number three, the user presses a button and checks their own vital signs using a built-in display. I think if a patient has a device like this, they will probably be very keen to be able to press this button and make sure they're still alive, make sure that their vital signs are sensible, in other words. And um, it would be uh, pretty unreasonable not to make that facility available. Then lastly, the fourth use case is the device is simply idle and it's waiting for the next measurement to take place. So those are the four use cases. Now, what we need to then analyze is how much functionality is needed for each use case, which drivers, in other words, which hardware blocks are need to be enabled. We then look at estimating the energy for each use case by looking at the power consumption of that part of the hardware. And that can be available quite early in the design because simulation tools will give estimates for power consumption. So even if the hardware design is still a state of flux, we will still have some estimates of power consumption. We then need to estimate how much time we will spend in each use case. So that will enable us to look at the amount of power over time, and that gives us the overall energy 
given that information, we can figure out how much battery charge we'll use over a given time period. And thus, we can figure out whether the device is viable. In other words, will it run with the battery that we have in mind? So here are some possible numbers. Um, down the left-hand side, we have our four use cases. We have an um, estimated current consumption for the combination of hardware that we expect. And then we have the duration of um, these things occurring. So, for example, the data upload takes three seconds. Um, so that's the second one down. We're going to do it um, 288 times a day. That's every five minutes. And the resulting um, time is 864 seconds in the case of the data upload. And if we multiply that by the uh, um, number of milliamps on the left-hand side, and we move it to be a milliamp hours per day, it's 60 milliamp hours per day. Now, if you look at those numbers, we can see different amounts of energy are used in different purposes. The bottom one, the idle one, it spends most of its time in idle, and that will use 24 milliamp hours, whereas the other functionality uses other amounts of energy. We can see actually taking a vitals measurement is relatively low cost. So we look at those numbers, and what we learn is the data upload is the highest use of energy. So perhaps by measuring uh, and uploading every five minutes, we're using too much energy. Is that really necessary for the functionality of the device? Well, we want to make sure that the patient is okay and things can change fast. But if what we did was simply make the measurement every five minutes, which that was low cost, if I go back to the previous slide, we see a making the uh, measurement uses uh, only 150 amp, uh, milliamps for one second. So that's pretty low cost. And then we do the upload every 30 minutes. So one sixth of the duration of what we did before. So we'll be consuming a whole lot less power on uploads. But then if the software spots a major change in the vitals, so if your heart rate goes up very rapidly or blood pressure drops or whatever, it could then do an upload at that point um, because it's obviously important to get that information to the doctor. Um, another aspect of the device, which is quite expensive, is the user vitals check. If we go back again to look at the, the um, third item down, it uses 320 milliamps. It takes 30 seconds to do. And we're guessing that the user will do it um, probably a couple of times an hour, maybe not quite as often as that. Um, and that uses quite a lot of energy. Now, the duration of 30 seconds comes about because that's the display time. Um, maybe they don't need 30 seconds looking at display to figure out that they're actually alive and well. So if we shorten that, we reduce the amount of energy. So this early analysis is giving us some lots of opportunities to adjust our design, adjust the way the use cases are configured in order to reduce power. <coughs> Excuse me. Now let's look at the operating system. Most embedded devices will have an operating system of some kind, and this can have a significant impact on power saving if it has support for power management features like DVFS and the, that was the dynamic voltage and frequency scaling and the um, idle low power modes that processors have. The most efficient way for an OS to accommodate this is to have a, a power framework. So you have a BSP, so the board support package is written to address the power issues, because remember we're very interested in what um, um, what devices are needed at any one time, and each driver will have some well-defined power states. So the power framework would look like this. The center of this diagram is the application code. The next layer out is the RTOS um, power management framework, and the next layer out from that is the hardware power management itself. So this is all the um, aspects of the hardware which can be controlled. If While I'm talking about power and the operating system, you might think that choosing an operating system does not have much bearing on power beyond having the functionality that you need. 
But a colleague of mine did an interesting experiment a, a few years ago, actually, um, just to see what the choice of operating system might do to the power consumption of the device. What he did was he wrote some software which uh, plays an MP3 file. It was a sine wave at 71 decibels. And he measured the power consumption in milliamps over a period of time. And you can see here, the power was fairly steady over the time. And there are spikes there, but this is probably the real-time clock primarily of the operating system. Um, but most of the time it holds at around the 400 milliamp point. This is using a real-time operating system. He then took exactly the same application code, but changed the operating system underneath, and he ran it under Linux. And the result he got then was an increased average power consumption. That was the first interesting thing. As you can see, Linux has a much wider band of power consumption, but it averages out at somewhat higher than the real-time operating system did. That was the first interesting thing that he observed. The other thing, which is um, just spurious, is you notice on the right-hand side of the diagram there, there are some big spikes. Well, that was Linux doing whatever Linux was doing. We, we have no idea exactly why it was consuming more power at that particular time. And as Linux is not a real-time operating system, we don't really have to, um, it isn't called to account for how it spends its time. So although Linux is commonly used for embedded applications nowadays and is perfectly suitable for them, you need to see that there is a cost associated with the simple choice of that operating system. A cost in power terms, that is. So we move through the operating system when we think about board support package and drivers. We need to define the power requirements for each driver. We need to specify what power states it will support. So typically on, and then standby and sleep. So um, different um, modes of uh, going to sleep and having um, the, the hardware off, of course, as well. What operating points will it work at? Well, a lot of hardware will only work at specific frequencies for one reason or another. Um, we need to find out what the hardware is capable of doing and make sure we don't make different demands. As most CPUs, you can clock the frequency over quite a wide range and it will still function perfectly well. So an example might be our device will um, work quite satisfactorily at 200 or 100 megahertz and it'll be quite happy with a one megahertz clock while it's sleeping. We need to make sure that um, DVS, DVFS participation is, uh, is um, accommodated. The last thing we need to think about is DMA, direct memory access. DMA is a process whereby a peripheral device transfers data to or from memory by itself without the CPU being involved. Now, normally that's a completely transparent process. Um, the software would set a transfer of data in, in, in motion and it would carry on in the background. However, if your device um, is going to have active power management, then if the CPU were to take control blindly, it might initiate a DMA transfer, then think, oh, I've got nothing important to do now. I might as well go into a low power mode, but the DMA transfer hasn't finished yet. And that would be bad news if the voltage is reduced and the frequency is taken down to almost nothing because the DMA transfer would be impeded by that. So we need to make sure that DMA transfers are accommodated properly. So when a driver um, is using a DMA transfer, it tells the CPU, I'm going to carry on busy, being busy for a while and CPU will not be uh, reduced. So the, the RTOS must know about that. Low power modes, hibernate and suspend is the names I've, I've chosen to use. The concept here is that suspend is when all the hardware is switched off, except for the RAM, the contents of which are protected. So the, the RAM is still powered up, everything else is shut down. So the amount of power we're consuming is reduced drastically, but RAM does consume a certain amount of power. So suspend is a drastically reduced power, but not down to nothing. Hibernate is an alternative which reduces the power consumption to essentially nothing, because what you do is you copy the RAM contents into some non-volatile memory, typically flash, and then switch everything off. Um, Hibernate can persist for you know, weeks and weeks, perhaps, without running the battery down. Suspend maybe is good for a certain number of hours usage, but not for really long term. So the careful use of these modes is quite important. 
a key thing to bear in mind is the costs of entering and exiting the modes. There's a cost in terms of power, ironically, because you have to execute extra software to go into suspend, to go around turning everything off. Um, in the case of Hibernate, you use quite a lot of power storing the RAM data into um, the non-volatile memory. And then you do some more power running software to restore it again. So you may actually use more power getting into, say, Hibernate than you save by being there if you're not there very long. The other thing, of course, is it takes a while to come in and out of Hibernate, not so much time to suspend. And this will affect device responsiveness. Um, and that's quite a significant factor in terms of user satisfaction. So it all depends on how much of the system is on when the mode is entered, and you need to look very carefully at just how much work is involved going in and out of these modes. Another factor with Hibernate, by the way, is flash memory has a limited lifetime. There are just so many re uh, write cycles that you can perform with flash, and eventually it will start degrading. Now, there are ways of mitigating that. There are ways of extending the lifetime. But if you use it too many too many times, you will actually reach the end of its lifetime. And a certain well-known electric vehicle manufacturer ran into difficulties of this nature recently. So it's not a theoretical problem, it's a real one. So we need to very carefully look at hibernate and suspend as to whether the benefit of them offsets the cost of using them. Um, for example, for our device, the measurement interval is relatively short. Um, so that would determine how often wake up is required at least. So if we look at the power saved by going into the modes, is it worthwhile? And if we adjust the measurement interval, we might suddenly make suspend and hibernate more efficient or more expensive, depending on what we do. Um, so the amount of um, power we're consuming isn't necessarily as linear as you might expect, because to be a sudden point when suspend or hibernate becomes cost effective, power cost effective. And the last layer of the software is the application code. The application development is where we will have least effect on power performance, but what we do do is perhaps adversely affect it. Now, using um, an operating system with built-in power features, a framework, simplifies matters because the application code writer is then rather less concerned with the details and can't do any damage. The operating system is doing the work. Now, we can, if you want to think about how this really works, you can think in terms of the application consists of a number of independent tasks or threads, um, much the same thing. Each task or group of tasks will register its power needs. This sort of corresponds to the um, use cases. And so this will be which peripherals it needs and how much power it needs, what, what kind of performance to do its job. And the OS will take care of that power management with the context switch. So the application code itself does not really need to think about it too much. Um, the, the OS controls how the tasks are run and therefore at the same time will make sure they're receiving the resources that they need. A really important area of power management is the measurement and testing phase. We've looked at estimates that we perform earlier on. Uh, we know what kind of numbers we're heading for. We need to measure to find out. We should be looking at measuring from day one. Now you might say, how can I measure current when I haven't got any hardware? Well, the answer is simulation. Um, simulated hardware will give you reasonable estimates. You can run software on the simulated hardware. That gives you the possibility. You need to do some planning. So consider very carefully what your requirements of the drivers are, define your use cases, and then you map the use case onto the application. And I would say that software engineers should be equipped to measure power all the way through the process. Early on, when they're working with the simulation, they'll need to be working very closely with their hardware counterparts. Once they have some hardware, there are devices available that let you monitor power over time. And you can look at the profile for your software using appropriate tools and look at not only what the software is doing, but how much power it's consuming at that time. This enables you to verify it's doing what you expect it to do. 
wir sind hier in einem kleineren, grossen Raumbüro. Bei der Leitung habe ich die Freiheit, dass ich, wenn ich anfange und wenn ich höre mit dem Arbeiten, eigentlich kann selber einteilen kann. Overall, how I will do it, it's just up to me and they give me a lot of freedom. Für mich ist die Faszination, mit anderen Leuten einen kreativen Moment zu generieren. Great colleagues, great environment basically. It's really nice here and I don't have any issues living here. Am meisten schätze ich in der Leica Geo Systems, dass wir ein sehr junges Team sind, sowie dass ich auch meine Arbeitszeit in einem gewissen Raum selber bestimmen kann. Und ich könnte gut merge in meinem Leben Hobby mit einem Office-Job. Das Besondere an der Leica Geo System ist sicher die Kultur und die Dynamik, die es gibt in dem Team gibt. Es ist jeden Tag ein bisschen anders. We have a good organization, which will help you to get used to the company in the first couple of months especially. Das ist sehr interessant und ja, macht mir Spaß. We should then therefore regard meeting power requirements as part of the spec, part of the code functionality which we are demanding. Now, for example, if you have a Wi-Fi driver, we would expect it to work well with all wireless networks. That's a sort of given. But we may also uh, want it to be able to be turned off and reduce power to almost zero and come back on again and be fully functional. That's all a pretty reasonable thing to expect. And we must be able to repeat that functionality and perhaps for testing purposes, just say 100,000 times will do, just to make sure that um, that functionality is completely reliable. We do not want our medical device waking up and then not being able to use Wi-Fi. That would be inconvenient. The drivers need their power functionality thoroughly tested. I've talked to people who've done power management on their devices, found that things are not quite as good as they expected, but they realize that's been errors in the driver design, which means that the enabling and disabling of hardware blocks is not being done at the right time or not being done at the right scope. And participation in DVFS may or may not be working properly. And the DMA requirements I mentioned earlier. If, if DMA uh, is not accommodated properly in terms of the reduced performance of a, of a CPU while it's uh, of the system while it's uh, uh, progressing, that would be a bit of a problem. So these are all things that need to be verified. At the end of the day, we need to look at the profile for power consumption. And here is our design mapped on to operating points. So here we have Hibernate, where we consume no power at all. We have Standby, where we consume very little power. And then we have four operating points, um, basically four different frequencies, which consume from about 200 milliamps up to nearly half an amp. So the use of these operating points by the different um, uh, use cases that determines our overall energy usage. Um, we're not varying voltage here. That's another factor. Don't want to get into that for the moment, but that's another option. If we take each of those operating points and we look at the percentage of time in a given hour that um, uh, that operating point will be used, and we see these percentages down the middle there, and we see that the highest operating point is 10% and then the next one down is 5% and so forth. And we've done this analysis by looking at our, our use cases. We'll be in standby for 20% of the time and we'll hibernate for 40% of the time. We can then compute how many milliamp hours that will consume um, by simply multiplying the percentage by the uh, milliamp hours um, on the board. And that gives us a total of 126 milliamp hours, which given a, a suitable battery uh, would give us perhaps 19 hours use. Now, is 19 hours use enough? Well, I would say for this particular application, that's just fine because the device will be used by the person 24 seven, but they're gonna sleep sometime. And I, I guess they'd be reasonably happy plugging it into a charger while they're sleeping um, and 19 hours is uh, enough waking hours. That gives you five, five hours of sleeping time, which should be enough. Um, so in other words, so long as we can charge the battery 
in that period of time, which should be no problem at all with modern battery technology. A 19 hour battery life means this device is viable. What if we didn't do power management? How bad would it be? Well, the answer is no power management would be operating point three all the time because we'd need that some of the time. And if we had no power management, that's the only option we have. We would reduce the battery life to five hours, which means that the, the poor patient would have to be plugging this thing in several times a day to charge it up or swap batteries in order to achieve this. It doesn't sound like a very practical device from my point of view. So the approach discussed so far should give us the kind of power performance that we'll be looking for. But there may be room for more optimization. I said we're going to start out on day one. It doesn't mean we set everything in stone on day one. We learn during the implementation of a device, and we can apply that learning to power management. What I suggest is a sensible approach is do a final review of the use cases, and you might find different changes you can do. So different use cases that you haven't thought of before. Slight reconfiguration of the software, maybe not very much, but importantly, a reconfiguration of the power management might yield better results. I talked earlier about tweaking the um, uh, the, the upload time. That's the kind of thing we might, have, might learn more about. And we could do that later in the design. We don't have to do that right at the beginning. Although at the beginning, we can start seeing those possibilities. But we might find there are other use cases later on that we haven't really thought about. A few conclusions. Um, I would see power as being a challenge for embedded developers indefinitely now. Well, power is always some kind of issue. Nobody's going to invent a battery with indefinite amounts of power in the near future. And if they did, the dissipation of that power would make the device too hot. Um, so even though better, better longer lasting batteries will come along in due course, I'm sure, um, it's not going to get drastically better. So we need to make sure we do everything efficiently. Um, it's essential that we support new power saving features on CPUs as they come along. And the most important thing is we must look at power planning from day one. We can't do optimization at the end. That's not really practical. So that more or less wraps up what I want to say today. Um, this is my uh, email address and the blog where I tend to write about embedded software um, in all aspects of it and other things that tend to be on my mind. Just one more thing I wanted to mention to you um, while I have the opportunity. Um, a book was published earlier um, this year, so it's quite new. Um, it's about embedded real-time operating systems. And this book uh, describes how they are designed, how you might implement one, and therefore is a very good guide to how you use an RTOS because by understanding what's going on inside it, you can use it most efficiently. That's the idea. It's published by Elsevier, Nunes is part of Elsevier, and it's available from all standard book suppliers. The other piece of information for you is if you wish to contact me after this event where you've, you've seen my email address earlier on, if you've noted it, but I'll happily repeat it for you. Um, however, I will be leaving the company, leaving Rental Siemens um, in about a week or so uh, because I'm retiring. So this is one of the last events that I'll, I'll be doing. So my personal email address is up there on the corner of the screen. If that's of use to anybody um, after today, you're very welcome to contact me. And I'll leave that there for the time being. So we now have the opportunity for a little while, if you have any questions, if you type them in to the uh, chat box on the left-hand side, if, if, if you, you, I think it's the left, yes, left-hand side of the screen there, there's a little um, icon showing chat bubbles. If you type, click on that, and then type on um, the, uh, into the box there, I'll do my best to answer any of your questions. So I have a question already. And the question there is, how would you recommend to plan for battery losing its capacity over time? So if you have a 19-hour battery, over a year, 
it might be reduced in capacity down to 12 hours, and that might be problematic for users. That's a very good question, um, because I think most of us are aware that batteries do degrade over time. Although, actually, I think degrading from 19 hours capacity down to 12 hours in a year would be you know, quite a drastic degradation that I would be rather upset about. But that general principle is good. We don't want a device with a limited lifetime. So um, an ad additional functionality, which we haven't talked about, but I think would be quite useful, would be for the software to be able to manage the battery state. I mean, if you ask your um, iPhone, for example, what's the state of the battery, it will tell you how well it's charging, what capacity it lasts fully charged up to, and so forth. And you notice over a period of years, they, they, they do um, tend to degrade and might need replacing. I know this was my, my wife's phone just needed a new battery replacement and it gave it a completely new lease of life. Um, modern batteries are much more resilient to the charging process. You don't necessarily need to run them completely down. Um, but uh, if, you, if you do, um, they don't mind so much as, as in the past. So... But this is quite important, and I think um, uh, building in the opportunity for the software to recognize this and warn the user is probably the best we can do at this time. Um, but battery degradation is something which, again, I expect to be with us for some years, although, again, compared with 20 years ago, modern batteries are magical devices, which uh, are so much better than we have seen before. So if you have any questions, please type them into the box there. I haven't seen any more for a minute or two, so um, I'm not going anywhere immediately. Oh, the previous question said, what safety margins would you recommend for battery capacity regarding minimum milliamp hours required? Well, I guess what you're asking there is, given that um, if our design would allow 19 hours operation um should i be putting in a battery that gives me i don't know 29 hours operation well that would be overkill how much margin do you need well i would say a 10 percent degradation in a battery over a sensible lifetime um is probably something worth accommodating um but realistically the 19 hours is quite a generous operating time as it is so um most people would probably be happy if their device would function on battery reliably for something less than 19 hours in a day. I suppose they would probably settle for 16 hours. Um, and um, so that gives you a degree of margin. So if you like, I would say the 19 hour, in the, in the case of this particular application, the 19 hours is probably a sensible margin as it is. And um, you, but the main thing is if you've built in the facility that the user can see the battery is degrading, it can be replaced as and when necessary. Um, the, the, the art of building the right charger and the right charging electronics and so forth is fortunately something outside the software space primarily. Um, but monitoring battery lifetime is a software exercise and uh, batteries um, um, do have a spec which uh, gives you um, information on how to measure their capacity in terms of their degrading, slight degrading voltage over time. I'm not a specialist in dealing with that particular area, but um, it, it's, it's something which is a well-trodden path. So I wonder if there are any more questions. I'm going to leave my slide up there for a little bit longer. Um, I have a, a one hour slot ultimately but of course, if uh, uh, nobody has any more questions, I will wander off and have a look at the uh, rest of the event in due course. If anybody's uh, interested, I do have another talk um, about 24 hours time, in fact, slightly less than 24 hours time, um, tomorrow's session fairly early on talking about the selection of operating systems for embedded applications. So I'll be very pleased to see you there if you want to come along to that. And as I mentioned, uh, as I am retiring shortly, that will be my last presentation in my professional role. So it'll be a historic event for me, even if for you it'll just be another presentation on a Friday, Friday afternoon, evening, morning, whatever day, time of day it is in your part of the world. But maybe I'll get some champagne in, maybe not. If you found this video informative 
make sure to subscribe our channel. Click the thumbs up if you liked it or leave us a comment on what we could improve. If you are looking for a job in the embedded industry or you've got one to offer, drop us a mail to jobs at embo.io. That's jobs at embo.io. And we'll make sure that you match up. My name is Stefan Bückelmann and as long as you keep watching, we'll keep covering the internals of the embedded industry.